Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased perspective as usual. Um, today I would like to waffle or to tell you a little bit about coloring problems. So um, I was stable coloring of numbers, which is a classical coloring problem, and kind of would like to explain kind of some fun theorems associated to it and kind of how it ended mathematics. So mathematics clearly is very ancient, obviously, so it goes back to well, the very, very early days of humans, I guess, but um, up to very recently, so 100 years is very recent for mathematics. Uh, mathematics was basically just number theory, calculus, and geometry. Um, just a little bit lying, of course. But one of those, a lot of major fields of mathematics were not present 100 years ago, including something like combinatorics, or graph theory, or linear algebra, all of that fun stuff was not really present 100 years ago. And it looks a little bit surprising from the modern point of view because, well, combinatorics certainly is everywhere, right? I had graph theory is also everywhere. And I'm not going to talk about linear algebra, but linear algebra is also everywhere. You can make the list much longer. Topology, category theory, representation theory, the list goes on and on. So mathematics really had a huge development in the past 100 years. And one of these developments, which kind of opened in some sense, the field of combinatorics, stretching my luck a little bit here, um, was coloring. And coloring came from, so coloring problems, and coloring problems really came from number theory. So that's why the word number appears here. And in the end, it turns out to be, well, one of the uh, main building blocks of modern mathematics. So we will go from colors, so from numbers, to colors, to sets, uh, to really logic type of set theory. It's kind of a fun ride. So uh, fasten your seatbelts, I guess. Okay, so here is one of the first coloring problems ever. I'm not quite sure whether it's really the first, that's hard to say, but it's certainly one of the first. And it was ignored for quite a while um, because it kind of was uh, before its time. So Shaw's masterpiece is theorem due to Shaw. And nowadays it's, it's well, it's Shaw's masterpiece, right? So uh, one of the most important theorems in coloring. And it works as follows. As I said, everything comes from, uh, originally coloring problems came from um, number theory. So it's about numbers. I have a graph on the right, so stay tuned. I will show you on the next slide where the graph comes in. But for now, actually don't look, let's do, let, not look at the graph, but at the set here. So I would like to color a certain set, which I call S of N. And S of N is just one, two, three, four, up to a certain number. So in this case, one, two, three, four, up to five. And I want to color it with n numbers. So n is two in this case, uh, with L n colors, not n numbers, obviously. And uh, Sn is uh, five. So I color the set one to five with two, two colors, uh, purple and red. And here's just one coloring of them. You can use any coloring you want. It could be completely monochromatic or like in this coloring here, like kind of a mixture or any coloring you want. And then there is sure theorem, which tells you about some properties of those colorings and the properties of all colorings in some sense. And this is how it works. So for all n, so I actually have a fixed n here. So in this case, n is two. There exists one, this guy here. Um, there's even a bound, but let's ignore the bound for now. So there exists some finite set that I can n color. Like in this example, here, I have n colored my finite set, and I find a monochromatic solution. That's a property here that I have, a monochromatic solution to the equation a plus b equals c. So let's have a look here. So where is a plus b equals c as a monochromatic solution? Well, for example, you can take a equals b equals 2, and c equals 4, and then, of course, a plus b equals c, and it's a purely purple monochromatic solution. Um, that's really a not obvious theorem. Of course, if you color everything, let's say in purple, then it's not very hard. But the point is, this holds for any color. And this was really a great theorem. As I said, was ignored for quite a while. Um, but it really was the starting point of almost all coloring problems you've ever seen in your life. Uh, if you have seen any coloring problems, of course. <laughs> so coloring problems are everywhere, kind of in graph theory, in number theory. Um, sometimes in number theory, they go under different names like uh, arithmetic progressions or something. But this is kind of kind of the starting point of all of that. It's really beautiful. Like it holds for all colorings of that set, right? For a given coloring, it's easy, but it holds for all. You will always find a monochromatic solution. 
And what I would like to stress here that this is really a question of combinatorics. And the way to stress that is to go to my uh, little graph here and explain where the graph comes in. Because in the end, it's really a coloring problem on graphs, but sure, I was way before graphs, uh, so formulated it in terms of numbers. And this is how it works. So I take my graph here, and this is where this funny number comes in. The graph should be the complete graph, roughly about n factorial times e. So e pops out out of the proof. So let's let's ignore e actually. So n factorial. So n was two. Two factorial is uh, still two, and e is. So let me lie. E is two point five. That's that's good enough for me. Uh, two point five. So it should be smaller than two times two point five. So my s n should be around five. So let's take it. Let's take it to be five. And here's a complete graph k five on five vertices. And complete just means you have five vertices so in this case, and they're connected. Uh, just completely. Uh, so everything is connected to everything. So three is connected to four, to five, to one, to two, and so is one to three, to five, to four, to two, and so on. okay. And now we color this graph using a specific rule, right? So now we have a graph. Good. And now color the graph. So I want to color the edge. I, J, and I really number everything, one, two, three, four, five, right? Just, just around. And I color the edge I, J with the pre-given color I minus J. So let's have a look at an example here. So um, three, one, there's an edge three, one. And I color the edge three, one with the color of three minus one, which I guess should be two. So I color the edge here in purple. So let's have another example maybe uh, five, four, five, four is, so this edge, the difference is one. So you color the edge in red. Okay, so color all edges using this rule. And then it's not hard to see, and this is essentially the proof of sure that we find a monochromatic triangle in this graph. So here, for example, I can see this monochromatic triangle here, like one, three, and five. And the monochromatic triangle is our solution. So let's see. So three, two, one is actually two because that's the difference. That's how we did it. Five, three is also two. That's the difference. That's how we did it. And five, one is four, which is the difference. That's how we did it. And indeed, that was our monochromatic solution. Two plus two equals four. Okay, that might have been a little bit too fast. Point is, there's a graph. The graph is colored. And we find a triangle in that graph of a fixed color, so a monochromatic triangle. And that triangle gives us our solution. Point is, that's what I would like to stress here, essentially this is a problem of combinatorics. It's just formulated in terms of numbers, but it really is a problem of combinatorics, uh, coloring of graphs. Okay, this is great, shows masterpiece, uh, a masterpiece, obviously, a starting point of a lot of coloring problems. And then people went on and they kind of asked kind of the natural question here. So instead of a finite set, you can think of a countable set like our good old friend N, which here is in bijection with, well, a finite set of five little ducks. It's not really a bijection because one of the sets is of dimension of size five, the other one is infinite, but it contains all finite sets uh, up to bijection and um, it's a little bit bigger. So you can actually think about the problem by just generalizing it. So maybe you would take colorings of N instead of finite sets. So what happens if you don't color finite sets, but you color N? Maybe something different happens. Maybe something changes. We can't tell a priori because it's kind of a bigger set that we color. No, little ducks here is a smaller set and all finite sets are contained in the bigger set. And well, little ducks is certainly a countable set. You can go to the next level. What about colorings of R instead of of N, for example? And so on and so on. Um, and that's what I'm going to discuss. And this is where set theory will enter the game, very surprisingly. I just modify the question a little bit because that's where I found the literature about. So link to the description. It's not A plus B equals C. It's a monochromatic solution. A plus B equals C plus D. It's essentially the same, but that's where I find found the statements I found the statement about this variant of Shor's masterpiece, whatever. But essentially, it shows masterpiece just with a slightly different variant of the A plus B equals C problem. Let's just go for it. So here are the theorems. Enter the theorems. So for any finite coloring of N, it actually works. 
So Schur's masterpiece still holds, meaning you fi always find a monochromatic solution. This is kind of kind of expected in some sense, and not the real meat are the other the other two statements. So for R, finite colorings are then boring because it always already works for N, which sits in R. So maybe let's ask about countable colorings of R. So if a countable coloring of R, and what about Schur's masterpiece? And it turns out that this is an undecidable problem in the following sense. So Schur's masterpiece works for countable colorings um, if CH is false. And CH is the continuum hypothesis, which I'm going to explain in a second. And Schur's masterpiece works and fails if uh, kind of it kind of turns around if ch is true uh, false true it kind of turns around so it depends on this statement of ch which is kind of a fun thing because ch is really just a statement in abstract logical set theory if you want and it's this famous continuum hypothesis which says there is no cardinality strictly between n and r so if you think about it so usually what people do is um so the cardinality of the natural numbers is denoted by this funny number Aleph zero, whatever. And then we can't really decide where the cardinality of R is. So this is the cardinality of R, the power sets of the natural numbers. And we can't really decide where it is. It's a statement that is can be proven to be independent of set theory, of the classical uh, set theory, the usual one, in the sense that mm, there will be models of set theory where it's true and there will be models of set theory where it's false so it's really independent you can you can edit as an axiom uh if you you could say it's true you could say it's false it doesn't matter the universe won't fall apart it really doesn't matter you can't decide it's it's basically a new axiom of set theory and this is kind of interesting you know, not just that well you have this classical statement that is independent of set theory but here is another statement that is independent of set theory namely whether Schur's masterpiece works or fails for uh, countering colorings of R. And that's kind of a more interesting statement in some sense, because that's um, a purely combinatorial statement, purely combinatorial statement, and it's independent of set theory. So for a long time, uh, most statements, that there are quite a zoo of statements that are independent of set theory, but they're mostly like in logic or some version of logic or some version of, uh, infinite analysis or something, um, but a really a combinatorial problem that is independent of usual set theory, that's quite rare. And it's a really simple statement, and it's kind of a little bit unbelievable that you simply can't decide whether it's true or not. So I say it again, it, it, whether it's true or not is not the correct question here, because both answers are completely legit. <laughs> and the, the correct answer is you can add it as an axiom, and it doesn't change anything. It's a really, really interesting statement, uh, independent of set theory, and a combinatorial one. Crazy, really crazy. Um, turns out that this is exactly the boundary case where this is interesting. So finite colorings of R that's boring, um, because, well, finite colorings of n already work. And you can do the opposite. So if you have a bigger, so here you have a smaller coloring set, and you can also ask the question for a bigger set to be colored. So V is a bigger set than R in the following sense. Well, you can make this very precise here. But anyway, let's just say uh, V is the bigger set than R. And then again, it's, there's no ambiguity anymore. It just works and there's no problem. At all. So the boundary case here with countable colorings of R is kind of exactly the interesting one where something funny happens that you get a statement which is completely undecidable in classical set theory. Okay, so let me repeat what I just said. So I think this, this theorem or this collection of theorems is so cool because you have a combinatorial statement that is independent of set theory. So Essentially, it's an axiom whether you want it to be true or not. You can just decide it doesn't make any difference. And that's, I think, a pretty cool statement. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will talk to you next time.